Okay, so we're going to start in a minute. Hello everyone, we warmly welcome you, outstanding teachers, educators, uh, in education enthusiasts, trainers from all around the world uh, to our first anniversary celebration. Uh, my name is Isra Osman, I'm a co-founder and Education Services Director at Teachigen. Uh, I heartily welcome our guest speakers, Mr. Nathan Wallow, Ms. Darel Uwichi, Ms. Maria, Ms. Sandra Stein, and all of you present here on behalf of Teachigen's team. In today's webinar, we're gonna discuss various points that are all related to empowering students and teachers to bridge the learning gap between online and in-person teaching post COVID. So uh, Ms. Nabiha, our moderator today, uh, she will be having the mic now and We'll start introducing our guest speakers. Thank you, Mrs. Shra. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to inform the attendees that after every presentation, there will be a question and answer session. So if you have any question, you can write that in the chat box and the questions will be entertained in the end. Now, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Mr. La Luigi. Mr. La, Ms. Luigi holds a master's degree in applied linguistics from the University of Brighton, postgraduate certificate in educational leadership in practice from the University of Manchester, bachelor in English language teaching, Delta and Delta from the UK. Her area of specialism is English linguistics and English language teaching. Ms. Loichi has been an active teacher of English as a foreign language for over 17 years. Her experience covers primary, secondary, and university levels in different contexts and continents. Ms. Loichi is known for being committed to institutional excellence with strong analytical skills and native speaker competence. Her latest achievement is the publication of an article on lesson planning and the use of technology to impact learning. Today, Ms. Lemichi will be talking about embracing creativity amidst the pandemic, bringing your resources to life through Wakelet app. Welcome, Mr. La Lemichi. Good evening. Thank you for uh, this nice introduction. Um, can you hear me and can you see me? <laughs> Just checking. Yes. Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. <laughs> Welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm uh, presenting from uh, Dubai. Uh, it's just gone over uh, 9 p.m. here. Anybody from Dubai, hello. Uh, and hello to everyone from uh, Saudi and Morocco, I can see from the chat box. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, whatever you are. Um, I hope my presentation today uh, gives you some insights into what we have done in uh, the institution that I work in. Um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, kind of a project that I conducted with the English department and as a head of the department uh, we did uh, want to um, uh, find out how we went through the pandemic and how we can uh, make that journey more impactful. So I'm reporting on a study, but also I'm sharing the, ex the expertise and the uh, outcome of our uh, project. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. Am I sharing? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
All right, so uh, here we are, all of us. We uh, made it through the pandemic. I know it's still happening, but uh, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and uh, I'm reporting on how can we be uh, creative and how can our students be creative and engaged um, in this uh, pandemic. It's almost two years. And uh, if I look back into where I was uh, about a couple of years ago, I, I would never have thought that I would be uh, coming through to where I am now. So uh, I'm going to be reporting on uh, that experience. Uh, the context of this uh, presentation today is how um, the teachers had struggled to engage students uh, during the pandemic, especially behind their screens. And in some contexts, students are not even uh, switching on their cameras. So we really don't know how we can engage students that we uh, cannot see. Um, their lack of interest in uh, quality writing, for example, in the English language. This has been a huge struggle in the English department. And then um, how we can make the lessons inclusive of all their needs and learning styles. And when I say this, you guys uh, remember what it means, differentiation. How can we differentiate online uh, to students who we do not see? Um, and uh, they are miles and miles away from us. And probably some of them are in the malls, just logging in or having an app, logging in through uh, their devices. So that's one of the um, struggles that uh, we had witnessed. Um, Wakelet app. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Wakelet app. This is an app that had made a huge impact in the learning of uh, uh, or the learning journey of our students and also in the uh, teachers' uh, lives. Uh, the outline of this presentation, we have two parts, the impact of the pandemic on edu uh, education. Uh, the study uh, does Wakelet app promote students' engagement. We had conducted uh, a uh, study to find that out. Then part two, examples of Wakelet uh, and Wakelet use with our students and our colleagues, and then a quick feedback uh, survey. Does this look familiar to anyone? <laughs> Just to uh, take you back to um, uh, March 2019 onwards, uh, February more like, right? Seems Have like you all ended up? <laughs> It does. Uh, the, the school is not high tech, I have to say. But uh, there you go. This is a scene probably many of you had to put up with uh, for so many months where you go back to your classroom and you only see the desks there. You don't really see anybody and you try to teach your lesson as if uh, everything is normal. That's a, that's a huge uh, struggle. Um, so for us is how to engage those students who are supposedly there behind those desks. It's just you can't see them, right? But you want to engage them. Um, so if you, if you have any answers, uh, you can please, uh, in the chat, jot them down. What you, have you done to engage your students in this pandemic? Any tips or any uh, uh, tricks that you guys have done or apps even that you have used to engage your students? Uh, just a few seconds. Um, uh, to see what uh, what you've done to engage your students. I may have to come out of this. Nearpod, Flipgrid, excellent quizzes. Yes, one of my favorite competitions, Kahoot. Padlet, Neopod, yeah, Edpuzzle. Mentimeter, very nice. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, we are uh, all in the same boat and we all heading the same direction. Yeah, these are some of the uh, uh, apps uh, and websites that we have used uh, to engage our students. And uh, yes, I agree that many of those are brilliant. Um, we gamified uh, learning to an extent, uh, chat box and polls, yeah, breakout rooms, yeah, absolutely, one of my favorites. Thank you for uh, your uh, participation. I'm just going to move on because I'm conscious of time. So um, when we look at the student engagement uh, is a mental state uh, that is 
the product of motivation and active learning. And I quote this from Elizabeth Barclay, uh, 2009. Uh, it's, it's a huge thing. Uh, it's really hard. It sounds easy, right? But it is actually a mental state. If a student is not motivated and is not uh, actively learning, he is not going to be uh, engaged. So um, I do uh, quite refer to this quotation quite often. How do we promote this engagement. And again here, this is based on the research that I have done about their engagement. So one of the things is to ensure that their learning is asynchronous and not bound to a particular time or place. Uh, again here, I quote uh, Kay and uh, Pasarika, uh, that it has to be uh, concerning both teachers and learning. Um, uh, so and learners. So most often, um, and one of the things that I have observed is that um, sometimes we forget that even if we are doing as asynchronous learning, uh, we don't just ask the kids to do it. We have to be both parts of that, both teachers and learners, and that makes a huge change. Once the teachers are involved with the students in that virtual uh, learning, virtual discussion and virtual journey, engagement is quite more um, impactful. Again, uh, we have to ensure that um, uh, simultaneous student-centered and student-faculty uh, interaction, whether it's um, uh, if school time, after school time, um, whether it's um, related to a task that you've given or advice on other things, it is extremely important that we have that student, student and student faculty interaction. And there are many platforms that do um, uh, engage uh, these two parties. Um, now, Barclay provides two aspects of student engagement. The thinking aspect, uh, where the students use um, higher order thinking skills and the feeling aspects where the engagement is through attention, curiosity, interest, motivation, excitement, etc. And this is um, the this part here, Barclays framework is actually the framework we have used in the study that we have conducted. Now, many of you might ask, uh, what is Wakelet? I'm just going to take you through a very quick a video to find out what Wakelet is, uh, just in case some of you uh, are interested to use this application. So um, here we go. Please let me know if you can hear the sound. Can you hear the sound? Yes. Educators are using Wakelet to save the best and most useful resources all in one place, organized into collections or stories that are easily shareable with their students. From articles to videos, saving Twitter chats and social media posts. You can organize this content however you like in a visual way. Students are using Wakelet for their assignments, writing essays, combining articles with social media, and organizing their research how it best makes sense for them writing their own notes, and uploading photos. With Wakelet, you take control of the best content on the web, handpicked by you, and it's completely free to use. So head to wakelet.com to get started. Pero un picancito que te queda rica la boca. So, uh, just a quick intro about uh, Wakelet. Um, again, um, we will have a look at some examples later on. Now, the study context is that um, we, we were trying to find out whether this Wakelet app can engage uh, students. Uh, we had um, five classes from grade 9 to grade 12 in, in Sharjah campus. Um, and uh, the platform was the Wakelet app. And we used asynchronous short story writing, and also we used other activities as well, but mainly about short story writing. Um, and it went through uh, term one and term two in the academic year 2021. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. We had uh, 47 respondents in the surveys. Um, the method of the study was um, asynchronous sessions and intermittent class display of shorted stories. Uh, you will also have a look at uh, some examples later on. The features that uh, the students have used uh, text, images, immersive reader, links, video uh, uh, recreation, etc. 
teachers and students uh, follow function. Uh, this is again something that uh, uh, promoted that uh, engagement between students and uh, uh, teachers. And we used, as I said earlier, Barclay's uh, analytical framework, the feeling aspect and the thinking aspects. Results, yes, Wakelet app promotes students' engagement. Um, and at both levels, the engagement uh, at feeling aspect and the thinking aspect. At the feeling aspect, uh, when the students filled up the survey after the study, 81% uh, of them um, absolutely enjoyed using uh, Wakelet as a platform for, for learning. Um, preference of 55% of the uh, participants of uh, Wakelet over other um, documents, such as Word documents, PowerPoint, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, time spent on um, Wakelet app, 72.3% of students uh, like to stay longer um, writing on the Wakelet app rather than normal writing um, uh, applications. And uh, justification, 54%, um, they all said because it is more fun, simply because it's fun. At the thinking aspect, um, the writing quantity, 81% of students wrote more when using the Wakelet app. 46% uh, uh, of students think the app has improved their writing, um, but other 46 were not sure. Again, because some of the grades were um, uh, beginner grades with us uh, on our campus, so they weren't really sure. But I still included this uh, data and this uh, analysis because it's, it's, it's uh, indicative of um, uh, the student's status uh, towards the app. Um, the structure and organization is uh, one of the things that the students liked. 50% of the students like the app because it is more organized. And uh, of course, uh, differentiation, which is um, one of the uh, most challenging things for teachers, how they can differentiate and cater to all the needs of all their students and their learning styles in a classroom sometimes that is only 40 minutes long. Um, so 62% support the individual learning styles because the app allows students with different learning styles uh, that they can learn uh, at their own pace and using the tools that uh, works best for them. Now, these are some of the narratives of the students. Um, this is the first time I used Wakelet. Um, it's improved my spelling. Uh, I feel I'm expressing my writing because the pictures, so the pictures also uh, helped in the story writing, it, uh, it you know, adding pictures, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the narratives. Now, the main features um, uh, that supported the students' own needs are um, the use of images. So this is one of the stories, uh, one of the students that we have, 70.2% percent of the students liked the app because it, they can use the images and that is something that helped uh, students who are non-native speakers of English. Um, some of them liked the writing stories so they come up with um, uh, well-known uh, stories in the literature uh, like Ro Robinson Crusoe but they actually came up with their, their own versions as well, Little Red Riding Hood etc. Um, 60 percent of the students liked the text option. Again, the app gives the option of writing um, uh, in text and um, we will move to uh, the next feature which I absolutely love which is the immersive reader. 19 percent uh, like that and again here these are my auditory learners who struggled with um, uh, reading some text. So all what they need to do is they write their stories and then they activate the immersive reader function and then it reads the story to them. And it actually helped them a lot with the spelling mistakes. So if it reads, if they write something, um, uh, you know, differently and it reads um, in a wrong way, they go back and check that word and change it again. So it helped them improve their writing. Um, that's the immersive reader function. 19% liked the app because they are able to use online resources. The app allows students to add videos or, uh, on YouTube or their own videos or uh, videos on Flipgrid, um, etc. So they quite um, like that. The concluding thoughts here. 
um, Wakelet helped engage the students um, um, uh, and improve their writing. They wrote more. They spent more time on the app creating their stories. They engaged more in Wakelet than other simple writing platforms, uh, just because they actually enjoyed the experience and they used different features which suited their different learning styles. Uh, more concluding thoughts. Um, they used higher thinking, higher order uh, thinking skills and 21st century skills. We all uh, know about the four C's, the communication skills, collaboration skills, critical thinking skills, and creativity. When I show you the examples, you will see uh, how uh, all of these uh, four uh, skills are integrated in one app. Uh, both teachers and students engaged in good asynchronous learning opportunities. Uh, we were able to follow each other and we were able to like and comment on each other's writing. Now back to the pandemic, uh, what is the impact? If I go back after this um, uh, study, the impact uh, of the pandemic on education. Okay, so we started off with that classroom, um, that miserable one that looked a little bit old, as one of you had said earlier, and the journey seemed um, uh, extremely difficult at the start, right? Um, looking back now, uh, I believe the pandemic has changed the face of education uh, drastically. Uh, it worked as a catalyst for educational institutions. Um, it, it helped the teachers uh, become more innovative uh, in swift solutions. Uh, it pushed them uh, up uh, a steep learning curve. It opened up opportunities to reimagine and reinvent teaching and learning into new normal. Uh, our new normal was through Wakelet. So that was uh, just uh, uh, my uh, conclusion there. Uh, we're going to move to examples of Wakelet. So I'll take you to some of my students' Wakelet work, just to help you out with your questions um, in the next few minutes. Okay, so this is my Wakelet um, homepage, and you can see here, um, I have a lot of wakes there. Okay, I do also use it for exam revision uh, guides. That's something else that uh, um, I've, I've uh, adopted um, after trying it out with the stories. Again, here, when I talk about creativity, uh, that's what I mean. Uh, it helped teachers become more uh, creative. But I'm showing you here the students' work, the stories that they have written um, uh, in collaborative. Uh, here, you can actually go into collaborative mode. Um, the students were able to write stories. They were able to add images. Uh, they were able to either add images from their own, um, you know, uh, photo library or from the internet, whatever it is. And we were able to look at their stories and give them likes and um, uh, follow them as well. As you can see here, um, I've got a few followers that are following my stories. And I also do follow um, loads of um, my students here who've been active in learning uh, story, right? So I can go into any person and I check on their writing. And uh, it's quite nice for any teachers who are struggling to find time to get all of the content delivered in the classroom, but at the same time, uh, getting that uh, feel of student-centeredness and creativity and differentiation, all of this you have to do. Uh, 1,000 things you have to tick in a lesson of 40 minutes sometimes. This is an amazing tool that might um, help loads of you, um, you know, at least engage your students and uh, get into a more productive work. So th this is um, some of the collections. We have also group collections here. I think I showed you those. Uh, we can bookmark stuff that we liked also. If you like any collection, the students can bookmark them and we do follow them uh, like that. Um, so I think I reached my time. I hope I didn't exceed my time, uh, Isra. That's it. Thank you from me. I'll, I'll share this survey just for my uh, improvement, really, and not for any other reasons. I'll put it in the chat 
if uh, you, um, uh, you know, just take a minute to finish off the survey would be brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delen. Um, Thank you. It was amazing. Now, Ms. Nabiha, uh, are there any questions in the chat box? Yeah, there are two questions. Thank you, Ms. Dalal, for introducing us to a wonderful application. There was a question by Ms. Sandra that did you face any problems with students adding images or videos of themselves on this app? Absolutely not. It's quite easy, actually. It's really, really easy and simple. You, ju you can add any video or any image uh, either. It gives you the uh, option of adding your own images or you use the images in the library. All right. So no there's another question by Dr. Ghulam Ali. Did you encounter any specific difficulties in using Wakelet? Uh, sorry, Wakelet you would like to share? No, not really. Um, again, I um, I create the Wakelet and then I share it with the, my students. I even share it with my colleagues uh, quite often. Uh, actually, even today, I did create a, a collection for uh, uh, my students and my colleague, who is the my parallel teacher, uh, was not uh, able to get to through some activities. So I did um, add her here as a collaborator. So you can add collaborators, you can share through the link. Uh, you can invite collaborators here, as you can see on, on my screen. Yeah. Uh, the good thing about this is that you can add Padlet links. For example, this is a Padlet link that I added for my students to start off uh, some discussions. Um, and so again, with one link of Wakelet, you can get loads and loads of things. You can see here, uh, all of my um, uh, students work. This has been done actually this morning. Um, so since ever I had um, known Wakelet, I cannot actually stop using it in many different ways. As, as I said, in, in exam revisions, in uh, uh, classroom work and everything you can imagine. You just give a link to students and they find everything in there instead of bombarding them with hundreds of documents. Oh, okay, there was another question that is this application free? Yes, it is free. Absolutely. I don't work with Wakelet, <laughs> so this okay. is not my, my way of promoting it, but it's free, yeah. Okay, there was another question by Ms., uh, Mr. Craig. Now, what age were your students with whom you used this application? Oh, uh, from grade 9 to grade 12. So roughly, let's say, from age of 12 um, to 18. Okay, there's another question by Graham uh, Alexander that do you find any particular age group or student level appreciates this app more than others? Um, I think probably it's a good question. Uh, maybe the graduates, grade 12 students, um, uh, you, you, you kind of, you have to go back and say, okay, you have this to submit, you have that to submit, because they think that they are outgrown all of this stuff. Uh, and I think it's the case with all the other submissions, but uh, lower grades, especially nine and 10, uh, have absolutely loved it. And they were the people who actually produced more um, uh, stories and virtual uh, stories there. Okay, so, yeah. uh, there's another question by Neyma, that Ms. Neyma, with student work being visible to everyone, did you find, did you not uh, face issues with parents? Um, actually, uh, if I show you here quick, um, the uh, app, you can make it as uh, private. It doesn't have to be visible to everyone. So if you edit your uh, wakelet, it will only be used, you, you have an option here. Can you see that? You can go for private. Uh, you can go for uh, unlisted and you can go for public if you want to. So you do have that option there. And um, I don't, I haven't actually faced any problems even with the students writing their own stories and adding their pictures. I haven't faced any issues with the parents, but it's a, it's a valid point. Uh, my advice is uh, use one of these uh, restrictions here in the setting uh, to suit your needs and, and that of your students. Okay. Um, another question uh, by Musarat, uh, is it can be used for university students? Oh yeah, absolutely. You can use it for, for anything really. Uh, I mean, as I showed uh, some of the examples there, uh, you can use it for anything. If you have, um, a, let's say university students, you can, you can upload 
your 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 slides, a PowerPoints. You can put, uh, convert them or export them in PDF and add them here. You can add a Quizlet game, quizzes game. Uh, you can add Padlet. I guess at university level as well. Um, students are involved in these types of, um, of uh, games. I've seen your comments earlier and in, in my presentation when we started, loads of you had written things about uh, Kahoot, Quizzes, Quizlet, uh, Nearpod, all of these. You just put the link in there for the whole unit or the whole term that you're going to be teaching and it serves as your uh, your blueprint more like for them they have one thing and they just go with that so I think it works for university students as well yeah along with university is it it's also helpful for primary school level right uh, absolutely school, yeah. I, I taught at primary school as well, and I would imagine that my uh, students that I taught at primary school would absolutely love this even more than the secondary school kids because they have all the little gadgets that they can use uh, in order to make uh, uh, beautiful things, and especially in story writing. Uh, you can do anything, by the way, not just story writing. Okay. There's another question by Mr. Yagya. I, I hope it's a Mr. I don't know, it's Miss. Do you think that Wakelet can be used effectively with face-to-face? -face? Um, I don't see why not. Um, Wakelet is an app that you use to promote students' engagement, right? And that could be online or offline. Um, I used it more for uh, uh, self-study sessions where we have been, as part of our work environment, the students have to do some uh, uh, self-study work where uh, all teachers struggled. How am I going to get the students to work? How am I going to get them to do some work and study, self-study? So I've used it for that purpose. However, uh, back to the back in the classroom face to face why not i think now after the pandemic uh we we are at a point of no return right we're not going back um, um uh, you know few years it, it's it sounds like we've uh, we've uh, stepped in the future and there is no return to the uh, old uh, style of teaching we are now there on the other side uh, of uh, the educational uh, uh, outburst and i don't think we are going back to just uh, the normal ways of teaching okay thank you are there any more questions if if there are you can ask And if the if um, you don't mind, if I can share also uh, my sure, survey, sure. It, it won't take more than a minute. Uh, sure, but just no problem. You're more than welcome to do that. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, listening, and thank you for your questions. And I hope you find it useful. Any questions uh, and, or any struggle from anybody, of course, uh, just reach out, and I'm I'm happy to help. Okay. There's another. Uh, I think it's kind of an uh, important one. That how can we, how can Wicklet be helpful for students with disabilities, or is it helpful for students with disabilities? Uh, oh yes, uh, for sure. I mean, again, here if we if we uh, think of students with uh, special needs, uh, we can we can think of many special needs, right? We can think of those who are not able to uh, to read, or those who cannot express their thoughts, or those who who cannot hear very well, or those who are are visual learners more than any other thing. So uh, again, here with the Wakelet, uh, you have all these uh, uh, features. So if you want to go with the immersive reader, you write a text and then you click on the immersive reader option. It reads it for you. OK, so instead of um, uh, you trying to read it out, most of my students who are uh, from low abilities, I actually ask them to use the immersive reader function where it reads for them. It helped them with the pronunciation, it helped them with the spelling, it helped them with the spelling mistakes. So it, it definitely helped those students. Others who are uh, visual um, and who are not able to speak up, who are, who are shy, um, it actually, I learned so much from my students where they added stuff about them and their, uh, their personal lives where I was shocked. How, how can you do all of this when you are a very, very quiet, shy student in my class? So it's not just uh, disabilities, as I said, but also students who are really uh, uh, or you know those who prefer to stay in their bubbles. I, I really believe it can it can help people with uh, disabilities or special needs. It's worth giving it a go. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zalinji, for introducing a once again wonderful application. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you okay, everyone. Thanks uh, for uh, your time and thanks for giving me this opportunity. Nice meeting you all. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce our second guest, our second keynote speaker, Mr. Nathan Waller. Nathan, Mr. Nathan Waller is the lead teacher trainer for the Macmillan Education in the MENA region with a background in child development and social and cultural anthropology. He has over 15 years of experience in education starting in early years education and special educational needs support in the UK, before teaching English in Oman, Egypt, Qatar, and Vietnam. He has also worked as a teacher trainer in Malaysia and an IELTS examiner in China, finally moving to Dubai in 2016 to work in educational publishing. Today, Mr. Nathan will be talking about, can a blended approach help us build back fairer? Welcome, Mr. Nathan Waller. Hello, good evening. Let me just get my presentation. Hopefully everybody can hear me loud and clear. Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Yes, sure. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hopefully you can see the screen as well. Yes. It's clear. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And thank you very much uh, to the Teach Ogen team for inviting me here this evening as part of their very special anniversary event. And of course, a big thank you to everybody else uh, for joining us this evening as well. I'm joining you also from uh, Dubai, hot and steamy Dubai. And I'm really excited to come and do this very kind of short presentation with you this evening about an area that um, I'm quite passionate about. I've worked in for quite a long time. Um, and what we've been calling here at Macmillan uh, for a little while now, advancing inclusivity. So I wanted to frame this session within a question. So can a blended learning approach help us build back fairer? Now we need to break this down a little bit. So I'm gonna kind of mention a bit about blended learning. Um, but then I'm going to focus really on this kind of build, building back fairer. What is that? What does it contain? How do we do it? Um, but I think this is going to it's going to take a, a slightly more philosophical turn, I guess, than the previous um, presentation. And I think it's probably going to raise more questions than it answers. Within that, I think I mean I would definitely agree with the things that I heard in the previous session about the impact of uh, the pandemic over the, the past 18 months. And I think well, the one thing I think we could probably all agree on is that teachers have shown just how capable they are of adapting and growing and developing professionally, even in the face of very great adversity. Um, and, you know, and there's a lot to be applauded for that, you know, and, and just seeing that previous presentation, you know, and the things that they've done, you know, really fills me with optimism about uh, the potential for new ways of teaching and learning and expanding and growing together uh, that education can hold in the future. You know, and I would pitch that question to anyone. Think about the last 18 months. Think about yourself. How much have you learned? How much have you grown? How much have you uh, invested in building a better teaching and learning environment for your own students and perhaps compare that to the 18 months previous to that as well you know previous to the pandemic those 18 months how much professional development work did you do if you're honest with yourself were you stuck in your comfort zone uh, were you happy with the way that things were kind of ticking along um, you know, in a lot of cases, teachers maybe had good ideas, but didn't want to rock the boat. Uh, we know that the status quo in education can often kind of uh, trump a lot of things that we want to do. And I think that, uh, and I would agree with what she says, that the pandemic has allowed us to, to innovate, to experiment, to try new things. And I think a lot of teachers have grown and learned and developed because of that. You know, and when I'm watching webinars and events like this, conferences, um, I watch social media a lot, you know, and I see that challenge there, teachers uh, advising each other, working together, uh, saying, you know, do we want to go back to the way things were? I hear the term new normal quite a lot. 
and I've worked in inclusive education for quite a while. So the term normal itself also uh, already sits quite uncomfortably with me. You know, what is normal? Who gets to define what normal is? Uh, what was the old normal? Did we all have the same vision of what the old normal was? Were we happy with it? Did we want to go back to that? So there's lots of questions, I think, around what, 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 what was normal, what is normal, and what could normal, a new normal even really be like. So we've heard, I've heard the term build back better quite a lot, but I like the, the term build back fairer. I took this actually from um, an Advancing Learning Macmillan webinar done by Laura Patsko, um, although I'm sure she took it probably from somewhere else. But I like this idea of, of building back fairer, making education more uh, equitable, I guess, for, for all learners. When it comes to blended learning, I think, um, and I agree with what she says, technology is definitely here to stay. The future is technology, uh, digital types of learning, whether that's online learning, I don't think many students want to continue a full uh, online learning environment for the whole schooling. Um, I don't think many parents definitely do not want that. But I think that technology, uh, technology within the classroom, beyond the classroom, allowing us to connect with students in new ways is definitely here to stay. What I'm worried about a little bit, and it'll be interesting to see as this new normal develops, whether or not face-to-face -face and online end up being opposed to each other, opposite ends of a spectrum, or whether or not we actually see it as blended learning, two things which are supposed to complement each other, they're supposed to work together, allow us more opportunities to connect with students allow more opportunities for students to connect with content and each other and the teacher, etc. I still think that blended learning for a lot of people is a little bit ambiguous. Um, and when I pull these two quotes out, uh, the first one is around combining face-to-face -face instruction with computer-mediated instruction. So this is quite kind of teacher-centered perhaps. And the second one is around uh, the integration of classroom face-to-face -face learning experiences with online learning experiences. So I guess those online learning experiences don't need to necessarily be outside of the classroom. But I like the fact that uh, it uses integration a bit more and it's talking more about learning experiences. So I feel like this is a little bit more student-centered. But I think for a lot of people, what is blended learning? How do you do it? Where does it start? Where does it end? These are the kind of questions perhaps we need to engage with a little bit more. To help us with that, there's definitely been a lot of research. Uh, so people have been trying to kind of conceptualize blended learning. I don't really want to go too much into this because of the time that we have, but you have this kind of quality versus quantity. We know that teachers don't have a lot of time with their students. So taking learning beyond the classroom is important, giving them more quantity. And we see things like a flipped classroom coming into this kind of conversation. But also how can blended learning raise the quality of uh, students learning experiences by giving them opportunities to engage with content in a variety of ways. Uh, the previous um, presentation also mentioned a lot about differentiation. So, you know, raising the quality by giving them different ways to see the same piece of content. I definitely don't need to talk about synchronous because I'm pretty sure we've all heard a lot about synchronous and asynchronous types of uh, learning. Um, the digital classroom, again, it'll be interesting to see, there was a nice question actually in the last, um, in the last presentation about whether or not Wakelet would be suitable for a face-to-face -face environment. And it'll be interesting as the pandemic kind of comes more to an end, whether or not some of those things do feed into uh, digital in-class uh, learning experiences, how teachers uh, take what they've learned in these last 18 months and, and readapt that, reshape it into new uh, activities and new ways to engage their students. And the last one, inclusive, which is what I'm going to move on to a little bit next. That's a bit about the, the half of the question, the blended learning part, but I want to move on more to the, the other part, building back fairer. And I would break that down into two aspects. I would say I would put it into it, inclusivity, and I would say sustainability is a big part of that as well. And this is the area that I'd, I'd like to focus on a little bit now, thinking about how we move forward, whether or not students are going back to the classroom or not at the moment. I mean, I'm here in Dubai and 
a lot of children or a lot of students are going back to class. I know that because I got stuck in a traffic jam this morning outside of one of the schools, which was totally weird because we haven't seen anything like that for a while. But lots of students are going back. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Before I do that, though, do think about what blended learning means to you. And when I say that, I don't mean in terms of, you know, the quote, uh, an academic quote. I think we can agree that it is the integration or fusion of face-to-face -face and online. But where are your parameters? Where does it start and end for you? What is appropriate and what is not appropriate to you? Perhaps engage with some of these types of questions. Okay, so we're going to talk about two aspects, advancing inclusivity and advancing sustainability. In terms of inclusivity, I think there is an opportunity for uh, blended learning and for education more generally to become more inclusive uh, post-pandemic, and this is something that I've been working a lot on. I've thought of a few things that I thought might be useful to kind of talk about. I think we need to accept that most students face difficulties in their learning at some point in their learning journey. It's a long learning journey, especially if you think about lifelong learning, it's a very long learning journey. But we all face difficulties and it could be, uh, you know, uh, explicit, you know, special educational needs and disabilities, but it could be uh, very kind of subverted things, things that we don't even know about. It could be things going on within the family home. It could be relationships with siblings. It could be they fell out with uh, a peer. It could just be individual things, hormonal uh, issues, uh, even where people sit within the classroom. And that falls within these kind of barriers to learning. And, and schools need to continuously uh, investigate, uh, discover, and challenge those barriers to learning. And they can be very simple things. Um, they could be things like glare, it could be things like background noise, um, it could be the environment, it could be the content, it could be the way we're assessing, it could be the way we group students. There are lots of things that we need to take into consideration. Is what we are doing creating a barrier for some of the students and how can I change what we're doing or adapt what we're doing to take uh, that into account? And part, for me, part of that is about having a, a proactive rather than a reactive approach to the way that we do things within schools. Uh, an example could be um, a student starts, uh, comes to the school, he's a new student, he's joining the school, and he has a hearing impairment. Now, a reactive school would be, okay, the student's coming in, what can we do to try and make that student feel included within the school? Whereas a proactive school would already have a policy where basic sign language is uh, integrated into the curriculum alongside what students are already doing from kindergarten or year one or year two, these kinds of things. So that when that student comes in, they're automatically welcomed uh, by the other students uh, within the school. Then they're not left to feel like they're excluded. And perceptions around uh, inclusion and exclusion really matter for students. There's a few other things as well, focusing on strengths, interests and passions, for example. Schools can quite often be quite weakness focused because we're exam oriented. Uh, you do work and it's never 100 percent, always comes back to you. And we need to take into account things like if you keep telling students the same thing, you're not good in this, they start to believe that kind of thing. So how can we change uh, the way that we approach that kind of stuff? And a lot of that is making hands uh, hands making learning hands-on, but also giving students lots of choice. The more choices we give them, the more involved they are, the more engaged they are. And we've seen that again in the last um, presentation. But I think at the very kind of core, the kind of central tenet of, of inclusivity is this ability to divest, develop and foster relationships between students, create that sense of community, create that sense of group, trust, uh, valuing, sharing, collaboration, these kinds of things. And also inclusivity needs to be a shared ambition. It cannot just be uh, something that one teacher tries to push through at their school. Everybody needs to be involved, whether that's uh, management, whether that's the teach teaching group, whether that's parents bringing them in as well and involving students as well. Uh, bringing their voice in, making sure that they're um, an invested part of what's going on within the school. And the last one, I'm not sure how much time I'm taking here, is uh, advancing sustainability. So I brought, uh, I narrowed this down to kind of three domains. I'll touch on each one very quickly. 
The first one is a sustainable approach to teaching and learning for students. And I've just mentioned inclusion. So we've talked about a lot of these kinds of things, but it's, you know, it's, it's thinking about how students feel, uh, how much are they involved? Are they involved in decision-making processes? This is really important for a sustainable education, I think. Um, you know, are we giving them more opportunities to connect? And that's where the blended learning aspect might come in. More opportunities to connect with their teacher. And I think that uh, technology and, and digital capabilities allow us to do that, but also connecting with their peers as well. Also, we've got a sustainable approach to teaching and learning for parents. And I think that we really need to uh, accept that parents have been far more involved in their students or in their children's learning than they ever have been, or for a lot of them probably, they have been a lot more involved. There's a lot of positives for this, of course. It's been very challenging for them. It's been very challenging for teachers, but there's been a positive, I think, uh, aspect to this, which is that I think that parents are often now a lot more understanding about what teachers do, what teachers go through, uh, how teachers uh, you know, are as professionals. Um, so they're a lot more kind of empathetic, I think, towards teachers. And what's going to be really interesting, I think, to see, and I, I hope there's going to be some, some research around this kind of area, is whether or not, like I just said, schools in Dubai here are going back. As uh, students go back into class or back into schools, you know, are we going to once again close the doors, close the curtains, you know, insulate ourselves, you know, we're happy, we're back where we want to be, you know, and are we going to end up shutting parents out? Or are we going to have learned from this experience and, and learn how to bring parents into uh, their, their children's learning in new ways that we haven't seen before? I'd be really interested to see that. And the last one is a sustainable approach to teaching and learning for teachers themselves. So I think that a future education, if that's what we're going to call it, it needs to be designed so that it's more balanced for teachers. Um, it takes into account that teachers are not just uh, employees, that they are professionals, that they, you know, they go above and beyond and they do that for their students, but it takes a toll on other aspects of their life. Are they taking care of themselves? And there's been a huge um, increase in discussions around teacher well-being um, and this kind of thing. You know, and are they taking care of their own children and their own families? These kinds of questions, I think, need to be talked about in terms of sustainability within education. So it brings us back to our original question, can a blended learning approach help us build back fairer? I think it can. Um, you may think otherwise, you may have other ideas, that's absolutely fine. I mean, I, I've, I've got a couple of questions that I think I would pitch to you guys. You can ask, answer them if you wish uh, in the chat box, which I've been able to follow. Uh, what do you think is needed for us to develop a more inclusive, equitable and sustainable education? Are you on the same kind of page as I am or do you have different ideas? Each person brings something to the table and that will help us all move forward. And what kind of practical things are you doing to build back fairer? Are you doing blended learning or do you think that it requires something else? These are questions that I pitch to people that I talk to and I'm really interested to find out different people's perspectives on that. If you want to know what I'm doing um, as part of Macmillan, uh, I started the MENA PD Academy, which is uh, free and open to all teachers, um, irrespective of what age you're teaching or what level you're teaching. If you're an English language teacher anywhere in MENA, you can connect with us at the Academy. Um, and we've got lots of free activities going on. It could be webinars, it could be, we've got some professional development modules. There is one on the website um, around inclusivity, uh, which is looking at inclusivity here in MENA. Um, and it's got uh, access to things like journal articles or blog articles, uh, stuff around special educational needs and disabilities. But the core part of it is uh, practical, giving teachers, uh, practical activities to do in their classrooms or their teaching settings, and then giving them support to reflect on those things. We're doing a lot of that stuff. Um, we've got one on teaching skills around literacy. We've got one around inclusion. We've got some stuff going on with project work as well. So go to the website and have a look at some of the things we're doing. It's still new, uh, but it'll grow pretty quickly as we keep adding uh, various events. I have not been keeping an eye on the time. So how am I doing for time? 
Does anybody have any questions? Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Mr. Nathan, Hello. for an informative presentation. Now, we have one question from Dr. Ghulam Ali. How to cope students' financial affordability of costly online gadgets when it comes to the poor in underdeveloped countries? Yeah, and I mean, this is going to be a, a huge uh, a challenge because a lot of people think that technology is going to solve all of the problems. And, and for, I think, the majority of the world's population, that's definitely not going to be the case. You know, it's, there's one thing for, you know, very affluent parents to be like, well, I'll just buy a few more iPads um, yeah. and sign up, sign up to all of these apps and my kids will, you know, survive the 18 months of the pandemic and then we'll go back to normal. But I think the reality is for most students in the world, that's not going to be the case. So I think when we say, uh, and I, I prefer, when we say technology, it doesn't need to always be expensive technology. Um, there are lots of things that we can do. Um, it, I think it's just, yeah, it's being proactive. It's thinking, about, it's a very difficult question to answer because it's quite broad, but don't think that it has to be flashy or high tech to have a lot of impact with students. I think if it's whatever you're doing is student centered, then it's bringing, it's thinking about what works best for them, I guess. It's a difficult question to answer there. We have another question from Natya. What would you advise how to work with students who have some special needs, how to involve them? Yeah, I mean, it very much depends. I mean, I work in special needs schools in the UK. It very much depends on the need um, and the severity of the need itself. So again, this is quite a broad question. Um, but I would always say communication is, is the big one. Um, uh, bringing parents in as much as possible and communicating with that student. They will tell you you know, what they like, what they struggle with. And the more you communicate with them, the more you can learn about them and the more you can adapt what you're doing and, and differentiate uh, to make sure that they, they achieve as much as they possibly can. Every student's not gonna achieve everything, but if you can push them to take responsibility, I guess, for what it is that they're learning, then, you know, hopefully they will reach at least their, their potential. And that's, that kind of like motivate them, motivates them to participate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think um, when, certainly when I work in, uh, in SEN schools, uh, there's definitely a mindset of this student can rather than this student cannot. Um, that's a really big thing in SEN schools. Yeah, not working from, and it's difficult in mainstream schools because we have to kind of pitch to the average sometimes because we have a lot of students. You know, I've also worked in schools where there's 50 students in a class. You know, and it's very difficult to get to know them all, you know, and, and tailor content for every student. Um, yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, Any uh, more I questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, uh, I'm just asking the attendees, do you have any more questions from Dr. from Mr. Nathan? Um, thank you, Mr. Nathan Waller. And once You're again, welcome. most welcome, and uh, good luck to everybody with their back to school for their managers. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Nathan. Thank you for a great session. Thanks, Isra. Uh, now, I would like to introduce our third presenter for today's webinar, Ms. Maria Zahir, founder of the educational webinar Jam. Ms. Maria is a highly skilled teacher trainer with extensive knowledge of the latest and most effective teaching methodology. She holds fellowship in higher education and masters in TESOL and applied linguistics from the UK with additional qualifications of certification in TESOL and PTLLS. She has worked in esteemed institutions and received multiple recognition awards for her research in teaching methods and in workshops, which have proven to be both creatively innovative and best practices for an ever-changing generation of students. She is going to talk about today emergency adaptation in teaching post-pandemic. Wasn't it over to you? Welcome, Ms. Maya Zahi. Thank you so much, Nabiya, for your kind introduction. And hello to all the attendees. And uh, uh, it was interesting to hear my uh, previous presenters, Nathan and Dalil, taking a more practical and positive approach to it. So I'm taking you back to the time we really started. And the purpose is why. Uh, 
uh, we were struggling in the beginning. I thought because it is 21st century, we were already into a tech savvy generation cohorts that we were teaching. And um, I think this change and this emergency adaptation was overdue. And let's see if you agree with me by the end of my presentation. So uh, today, uh, the, the areas I would like to touch based on is what is emergency adaptation? Why did the education area face a chaotic scenario? How can we avoid this in future? And some implications for stakeholders. So what is an emergency adaptation? What really happened? Happen? So shifting from the concept of online learning to emergency remote teaching had brought new challenges opportunities at a social and technological level, which influenced the physical and mental health of children. Although it here, it just states to the mental health and physical of the children, but the teachers it's themselves were also suffering from this challenge. And um, uh, the most uh, challenging element that I came across was the technological level, where the teachers lacked the knowledge of using technology to implement it in the classrooms. And despite having a um, numerous number of webinars at my platform and as well in other uh, renowned platforms, um, the struggle was still ongoing. And, uh, um, and we're just trying to figure out what really happened. And uh, I think the shift was overdue. We should have uh, embedded this um, tech, ed tech knowledge and use of ed tech tools way before the pandemic in my point of view. So what really happened? There were so many ICT platforms. Uh, the usage was there, but there was minimum. There was an educational process going on from the te personal teachers adaptations to student personal adaptation. But when the pandemic came in, in higher education space specifically, uh, because uh, we do use lots of Kahoot and Quizlet, but there was an academic element to it where uh, we had to go to a new tool and figure out how we can use Padlet, how we can use any other tool where there can be some academic element to the higher education. And especially to the part where we had to assess our students and uh, to get a solid rigor of, out of that assessment was a challenge. And um, we all faced that across the globe. Right, so before I move on, I would like you to think, look at these pictures and relate yourself to it. So for me, the ones I have ticked is something that relates to me. So I like combining things, create opportunities and breaking the routine out of clutter, find creativity. So I would like the attendees to take some moment and please think of and relate yourself and tell me which one is best for you. Sorry. If you could use the chat box and tell me which picture um, relates the most to your teaching style or your approach towards lesson preparation. You can uh, type up one of these things in there. Colorful lemon, <laughs> that's interesting. That's very good. Curiosity is the spark. Yes, definitely it is. Shuruk has shared her thoughts with her about the colorful lemon. Develop your unique and hidden potential. Anybody else would like to share their thoughts? Did you ever come across a moment when you thought I can't and I'm losing my stripes because of it, because you were too uh, anxious to go online and try something new and the thought of being failing? Okay, Sandra says, yes, yeah, I know. That's, that's an honest one, Sandra, thank you. Um, okay, colorful lemon at the moment, that's interesting. We have some interesting answers here. It happened for Natia as well. Yes, it did happen in the beginning. Obviously, we were all struggling to adapt to the new normal, so to speak, um, and uh, relate ourselves to one of these pictures here. Uh, well, uh, well, the moment when I felt like a whale and the other moment I felt like a penguin as well. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you so much for your input. 
Yes, so yeah, this is something I thought was, um, it, it, it's a characteristic that all us as teachers have in a and S. So um, if we can be a camel standing on an iceberg and thinking, where am I? What am I doing here? Why, why, did, why didn't I quit before this pandemic? And honestly, these thoughts did come up uh, at a stage when we were all were struggling. But if you were a teacher who already was uh, into this techno ed tech tools, was already using it in your classrooms, so uh, it wasn't that challenging for those. But uh, over the time, we learned from our lessons and we adapted according to um, uh, the challenges we faced. Interesting. Thank you for your answers. So um, I'm sorry about this. So for me, um, I took this from James Arrington and uh, orientation for critical digital literacy for forming online learning. So classroom practices, there was understanding, connecting and circulating, sharing learning, experimentations, platforms and tools, focusing on affordness and constraints of the privilege modes. So um, there was connectivity issues for teachers, uh, some institutions didn't have enough resources to get the teachers online, uh, students struggles because of that. Collaborative redesign and rearrangement of online platform features uh, was a key to the success or the failure of this transformation of online teaching. Visualizing online community networks and students' social, we do say, okay, we can use these um, um, awesome tools that we have at Tech Tools, but the transformation and implementation of these tools was still lacking. Uh, and students, the teacher, there was a whole chaos around the educational arena and um, re -con um, context and the regenerating students' writing communication was the biggest thing. Like we did have uh, videos closed and mics closed, but we never knew where the students were still snoozing off or they are in part of the lesson. And composing texts um, and you know, taking a range of modes and ways to uh, foreground and counter narratives um, for the more academic classes was also a biggest challenge. Through collaborate, especially we are used to, on face-to-face -face teaching, we used to lots of group work, peer work, um, until we, you know, found breakout rooms at Zoom, or we found Padlet and such platforms over the process. And we learned we can still use that being at home and continue doing that collaboration like we did in face-to-face -face classes. So um, I think and really hope that teachers do continue to use these in their classrooms in future and understanding of which modes of expression and participation are privileged and which are excluded so that a course is redesigned appropriately for the level you are, you are teaching. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, from some of the educators sharing the thoughts about students who are, had uh, learning disabilities and students that are, you know, are visually impaired. Um, uh, there were lots of other ways and apps, but to a very minimum level, I, I will agree to this point that um, to that help the visibility, visible visibility of those who were unable to do it without their disabilities. Understanding of how design elements and the features of digital tools respond to and shape the expectations of online communities, reflecting who is invented in and who excluded. So um, even today, although we are back to our face-to-face -face teaching here in Saudi Arabia, uh, but unfortunately, again, we are still using an LMS. We are still giving students work um, because uh, we cannot exchange physical papers in the classroom. So um, I'm glad that over this one and a half years, we have learned different ways we can use the same tools in the transformation of online to face-to-face -to -face now. We could transition that same learning abilities that we learned, lots of tools through trial and error and use that in our classrooms even today. Um, group work was again a challenge, but again, uh, these ed tech tools really helped us to learn. And even um, I am today in a face-to-face -face classroom, but I am still using these tools and this transition really helped me. And um, it helped me to strengthen my abilities, which I had uh, before uh, this pandemic. Ownership of digital tools and platforms available for use and reconfiguration of boundaries set for online learning context. Um, 
I agree to this. Like I do keep on hearing, is this platform free? Uh, this was the biggest challenge because lots of the great features were all on paid paid features. So this, this was a continued struggle for teachers where they could enhance their uh, teaching class, learning and teaching process in a way where the free app could provide instead of a paid one until uh, uh, institution was ready to pay for it. Right, so um, before I continue, I would like the attendees to please uh, take part in this poll and give me your feedback. How would you as an educator describe emergency adaptation education post pandemic in one word? So the only way you can add, add to this poll is if you go kindly go to polleb.com and you enter Mario Zahir 806 and respond to this activity, please. So I would like to hear from you as educators across the globe joining us today. How would you describe this emergency adaptation in education? If you all could kindly go to Google Chrome and type polleb.com and then enter Mario Zahir 806, you will be able to respond to this activity. Just one word that will describe your feeling towards this adaptation. So it is polleb.com. Thank you, Nabiha. And if you could enter Mario Zahir, eight or six. Mario Zahir 806 is the, thank you Nabiha once again. <laughs> Dead end, okay, Mr. Nalam, that's an interesting one. I can see one of the responses in the chat box as a dead end. That's scary. I would like to hear more about this by the end of this presentation if we have time left. Um, are we able to navigate to this poll? And wait for another 30 seconds for the attendees to navigate themselves. Or you can use the chat box if you're unable to figure out. I can read your responses here. Challenging, yes, interesting. Yes, it was challenging, most of you are saying. Exhausting, chaotic, yes, hectic. Point of no return, was it? Mr. Vlam looks like had a lot of chaotic times there. Interesting. Messy, yes, initially it was when we were trying to, yes, Nathan, panic, panic, chaos, lots of good words coming up. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, so the chaos was there. A learning curve, definitely it was a learning curve. With, with time, we were able to uh, adapt with, with smoothness, with a bumpy ride at the beginning, yes. A giant learning curve, yes, Sandra, yes. Everybody's speaking out from their heart. Well, yes, I would like to uh, add on this opportunity in a positive way. I think it gave us as educators an opportunity to improve our skills. And um, it was an interesting way to really come out of a box and really come out of our comfort zone and think um, what we were really lacking in our skills because we were so much into face-to-face -face teaching and um, we were unable to adapt to this emergency adaptation. Um, terrifying for Rabia. Thank you so much for your input. I really appreciate. Um, I wish you were able to navigate to this. I was trying to check how tech savvy you, got, you are now. So there was a nice uh, word cloud that comes up. Um, okay, 
So for me, the question goes back to, wasn't the adaptation of new normal of distance teaching and learning overdue? Um, like I said uh, a moment ago, it, uh, we were so much stuck into our daily routine of papers and uh, printings and whatnot, staying in the copy center room and uh, trying to prepare for our classes, worksheets, whatsoever. Uh, looking for the handouts and printing and on and off. So um, uh, this was the biggest thing that we came up with. There is no paper. What will I do? We were all making PowerPoint presentations for a lesson, but going paper free was the biggest challenge. And um, I think where the global warming was going and the, where the earth is going, we as educators also have the responsibility to, um, uh, to you know, put in with paperless activities. So uh, this online teaching helped us to go and um, it was overdue, I think. And uh, I thank God we all got a wake up call in a sad way though, but uh, hopefully we, I do hope that you continue to use that in your classrooms in future. Uh, does uh, anybody would like to add to this thought, please? I would love to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, Nokia 7210, the buttons one. I still love it. It was so much easier. Life was so easier. Just open a phone and uh, click a button and move on. This um, tech savvy tools have really, you know, I think we are becoming slaves of uh, the technology as well. We are becoming so much independent on that. And um, I think I still have mine in a drawer somewhere of Kenneth, and that's interesting. Um, I think I also have one I, I used to love. That. I used to have a little mini green one, I still remember, one of the luxuries we had when we had phone. Um, and yes, uh, and now, you know, because the social interaction has also sadly uh, reduced a lot among the families, among the friends, and um, it's because, you know, they were. Uh, all the time, kids are on the phone. Uh, even if you go to a restaurant, you would see four friends sitting together, all four of them on their phones. Um, uh, so over dependency of technology in that way uh, is lethal. But in education sector, uh, I think we had to incorporate that and we were still lacking. We were still, oh, uh, this worksheet printing and going on the traditional way was just fine. Okay, some interesting answers. So um, I would just like to add some implications here. Uh, it has also revealed that technology is inevitable and distance education may become an important part of our lives in the future. Like I said, I'm, I'm back into face-to-face -face teaching, but uh, that technology element is still there in my classroom. I am still teaching paper with paperless um, things and uh, I'm posting things on different platforms for my students. Uh, and we are still, you know, have in social distancing in classrooms. So we have become more dependent on technology than before, and it's hard to avoid it now. Uh, using learning management systems and other platforms on various ideologies and experiences regarding uh, digital tools and online platforms, it, it, it exerts a powerful influence on how teachers and students take up the pivot and to long-term online learning making efforts to cultivate digital literacy, complicate and likely contentious. Educators and students defamiliarize themselves with the existing perception of dominant digital technologies. Um, there are thousands and thousands of applications that have come up um, over this one and a half years, and it is hard to catch up, to be honest. But uh, some of the most dominant, which I keep on hearing is Quizlet and Kahoot and Quizzes, and Padlet is the most, and, and Google Slides and Google Apps are amazing as well. Those who are not very tech savvy uh, have the basic level of technology usage. I think these, uh, these are some of the ones that are really good. Um, a necessary step that can help educators more readily redesign, impose online learning spaces in ways that student-centered. That was the biggest issue. Um, because the input of the teachers we had to be very interactive and we wanted the students to be engaged throughout the lesson. So this was the biggest challenge to have a student-centered online learning process. 
and promote the values of agency, invention, and critical consciousness. Um, we had to design our thoughts all over again. But uh, for interestingly, I could still use the tools and incorporate some of the worksheets and the graphic organizers whatsoever uh, using Google Slides. Simple Google Slides have very cool features that I could continue using like I was using in my face-to-face -face, uh, classroom. So the I was able to bridge the gap, if you like, from face-to-face -to, -face to online teaching. But then again, it depends how uh, how you took the approach, if you were into a panic and a chaotic mode. Uh, so I think in a general situation as well, that uh, it blocks your ability to think in a positive way. So teachers can facilitate opportunities to students to forge their own path to authority. This was something uh, I really wanted to share from Indira and Pandya um, 2013, although it was long way back before pandemic. But uh, we all know that student-centered and giving the autonomy to the learners to, to select and the ability to uh, take charge of their learning was essential part of our teaching anyways. And they are way more tech savvy than us. So we could have given the students the ability to select any tool that they know that uh, as a teacher, I would, I would use in my classroom. So it was giving autonomy to the, to the students to introduce something. So perhaps I was um, able to tell them to use um, uh, a tool to, to do the presentation with me, although I was teaching on Zoom, but they were using some very interesting tools that I never knew and I learned from my students. So um, why not? So we are, it is an open book, like we, the world is a big platform, lots of technology tools keep on emerging every day. We cannot keep up with everything, but you'll be surprised when you give the autonomy to the learners they will be able to give you a lot of tools that are very user friendly and um, not very challenging as well. And of course, the most important element, um, free to use and uh, with lots of cool features. So we rework and post online tools the way they respond to their interests. So of course, when we talk about student-centered uh, and we talk about autonomy, so we have to rework it around and something that responds to their interests reflect their lives and transform their learning into more equitable, something that will have more productivity. There was active learning. They were able to produce something that they really liked. Uh, use of simple Twitter. Um, Twitter was something very interesting when some of the teachers used in the classrooms. We were using it in our private lives as well. So, you know, um, getting them involved in that in the classrooms was something very interesting as well. Okay. Right. Well, thank you for listening and stay in touch. Um, this is the website of um, the founder of, and we have done lots of webinars on EdTubes and all the recordings are on our website. You can contact me from there. And I am open to any questions you wish to ask now. Thank you, Ms. Maria, for your wonderful and informative presentation. Thank you so much. Questions, we have two questions so far. One was from Ms. Isra. Is there any website that can help teachers to make online class more interactive? Well, mine. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of webinars recordings there. Um, I started from EdTech tools, simple uh, tools like um, using Kahoot, using Quizlet, step-by-step uh, step -step things like Peer Deck. There are lots of hands-on trainings there with recordings when uh, anybody can go back and refer back to. And um, it also interesting concepts like HyperDoc was something very interesting that I myself did on my platform. And um, HyperDoc is for primary students as well and for higher education. So um, the goal was to focus on all the levels of education teachers where they can use their thoughts and work around it. Okay, uh, there's another question by Ms. Nakia that what about primary kids? Like, is there any website like, or your website is good for primary students as well? Yes, there is. Um, like I said just a moment ago, that I touch base to all the level of educational sector. So although I am a part of higher education, but I made sure that I am going from young learners. We had some interesting presentation by StudyCat 
Uh, it is an interesting learning tool uh, for the young learners. Have a look at that. We had um, people presenting from there and some very interesting ideas are there. Okay, there's another question by Dr. Gulam. Do you see the issue of willingness to adapt with senior teachers who are not tech friendly? If yes, how to motivate them adapt and transit to technology? Uh, well, um, there's something very interesting research I did uh, bef uh, before this pandemic started. Uh, we had had uh, collaborative uh, learning sessions with my teachers and um, they were uh, you know, sharing ideas in a very informal way with the colleagues teaching the same, same uh, course. So what was happening, the teachers who were very shy in using technology found it that uh, during those collaborative sessions, that it wasn't all that hard to use technology. So we were you know, just sharing a simple activity, uh, for example, Quiz Dead Live, how they can use it to recycle vocabulary they have just taught or just for brainstorming or uh, sharing ideas on Padlet. So uh, I think there are lots of webinars and the formal things that um, uh, they're going on, but teachers, I think, need something more intimate, something they can learn from their peers and colleagues in a very informal way. And, and that helped a lot. I, I did a whole research and my paper is publishing soon about it, um, that how this collaborative teaching really helps in the teachers who are struggling at the moment. Okay, okay. are there any other questions from Ms. Maria Zahi? Right. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Maria, once again for your wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me over today. And uh, you can still stay in touch. And you're most welcome to contact me. And if you wish to see anything on our website, you're most welcome to attend our webinars as well. I would really thank uh, Teacher Jen to invite for my invitation today, and really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank no, you Ms. I'm Maria, for such an engaging session. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Esther, I appreciate that. Now I would like to introduce the fourth presenter of today's webinar, Ms. Sandra Stein, a senior instructor, instructor at the American University of Kuwait and has been an educator for over 30 years in both K-12 and higher education. She firmly believes in Ralph C. Smedley's philosophy, we learn best in moments of enjoyment. Sandra has found that one of the best ways to ensure student enjoyment in classes is to get them fully engaged in the learning process. This helps students with diverse abilities to improve. Sandra was director of the IEP for three years. She's also a distinguished Toastmaster who has excelled in training, leadership, and public speaking. Today, Ms. Sandra is going to talk about encouraging student engagement through talk moves. Welcome, Ms. Sandra Stein. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I would just like to say that I really enjoyed the previous three talks. And mine is going to be a little more practical because when I switched, like everybody else did, to online learning, it was quite a change. And I had been using technology in my classrooms and students were used to it, but getting them from the point of greatly engaged to switching them online, all of a sudden these highly engaged students of mine turned into like zombies and they just, <laughs> they didn't want to participate. They didn't uh, go forth and you know uh, do anything in the classroom for a while. And it took me a good bit of time to be able to finally get them engaged. And it has been an enormous learning process. And I have, oh my gosh, I've learned so much. But I must say that when one of the things that I really was looking for was how to get them to Hello. Can you mute yourself, please? <laughs> Thank you. This is one of the joys of online. Okay, so how exactly do we get to the point of 
engaging our students. And I would like you to please go here to this site. Whoop, I went the wrong way. Um, or you can type it in, you can type it in the, in the chat either way. What have you tried before to engage your students in the classroom? Something that's worked. What have you done? Zombie, yes. They, they were. Okay. Nearpod, online games. I think most of us answered this question with our first presenter. Um, Sandra, could so you please share the link in the in the chat box, the chat box, so yes, we can uh, yes, okay. access it? No, Thank I you. Was, I was trying to do that. That should be it. Pasting. Don't know why it's not pasting. I'm not having a. Okay. Here's what we'll do. So Sandra. Uh, or oh, uh, written the link in the chat box. You did? I did, and I'll copy paste out again. You are amazing. Thank you. That's all I have to say. So let me go. Okay. So if you can sign in here, this is great. If you have Nearpod, you can just put in this code up here, HGQP2. Otherwise, no, anybody? We're all being non-tech, is that it? <laughs> it's okay, no problem. I will just go back to my presentation, okay. So when we think about engagement, there are several things that you want to consider. You want to make sure that your students feel safe in the classroom environment, because if they don't feel safe, they are not going to engage. You want to make sure that students and teachers have time for social interaction, not just student students but also students and teachers this is really important you also want to make sure that there are lots of opportunities for active learning whether it's online in person or hybrid it doesn't matter we all need active learning and there needs to be a clear structure or a format for the lessons for myself i used sofla uh, but I'm not going to get into that because we have no time and that's a whole lecture by itself. But if you want to learn more about it, I can tell you uh, or you can send me an email later on and I can share that with you. Also, you need to make sure that your expectations are clearly defined. What, how are students being evaluated? for the work that they are doing. They need to know that and they need to have frequent changes in the lesson to keep up the pace because it's, it's important face-to-face, -face, but it's crucial when you're online. So in order to create this safe environment, you have to have a sense of community. And there are really three things that you need to do to establish a solid sense of community in your online classroom or even in your face-to-face -face classroom. And the first is to create a social presence. You need to help students get to know you as a person. For myself, I used Bitmoji and I created a, a Bitmoji avatar of myself showing me teaching from home and then I put in information about me, my hobbies, my children, my cat, and I ask students to create their own. We did this in the very first week of class and students were required to then comment on other students and they loved it. And we got to know each other and it really changed the atmosphere. Also, you need to get to know your students. This helped me to get to know my students a lot. 
if there were things that they wanted to send me privately, they could do so. We used Moodle as a platform and I used Moodle Forum a lot and that helped. And also you need to help the students get to know each other. So it's important, especially at the beginning of the semester that you spend some time allowing them these icebreaker activities that are going to kind of clear the air and help them feel comfortable of working with each other because they're gonna be working with each other all year, sorry, all semester in upper ed or all year in K to 12. And it's really important to create a safe environment. How do you do that? You need to establish norms of respectable interaction with the teacher and with other students. I tell my students right up front in the very first week that I absolutely will not allow any sort of disrespect going on in my classrooms. And if they are disrespectful, then as a college instructor, I get to say, I'm going to put you out of the room. You also need to set clear repercussions for breaking these norms. You need, students need to know, okay, if I break these norms, what is gonna happen? And mostly you need to reward students for actually following the norms of the behavior because that is reinforcing. The last thing that you need to do to create a strong sense of community is to create opportunities to interact. This can be done in a whole class discussions. It can be done with partner work or partner discussions, small group discussions or work, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, written forums, group project work. Now, how many of you have actually heard about talk moves before? You can write it in the chat. Have any of you ever heard of talk moves before? Yes, no, or not a clue. I personally, yeah, I had not heard about it at all. I knew nothing about it. And I was looking for something to help structure discussions, academic discussions in my classrooms in a way that would help students. I had a lot of really shy students. I had second language learners and I wanted to help them in a way where everybody felt comfortable talking instead of having one or two students who were very, very talkative and the others would just sit around. So I found out about this talk moves. It's actually, it was actually designed for a K to 12 math classroom in 2009 by Chapin and O'Connor, sorry, Chapin, O'Connor and Anderson. And what they found, it was designed for English language learners. They found that if you carefully scaffolded the classroom discussions, then this could be a key to success. And what they did was they had, through the context of discussions, the students were able to develop logical reasoning learned how to make support for their arguments, learned how to voice their opinions. And even though their work was centered on math, it actually, these principles are used throughout any content area at any level, K to 12 and upper ed. And it can be used by anyone. They are fantastic. Not only is it good for English language learners, it is also amazing for students who are shy, students who just learn differently, students with learning disabilities. It is amazing. So today I'm gonna to talk about four of the talk moves. There are more, but I only have time to go through four. The first talk move is revoicing or clarifying. As a teacher, you need to use talk moves as well in order to teach your students and to encourage your students. So as a teacher, you would repeat what a student says 
in another way to help clarify that student's thinking. You could say something like, so you're saying that da, 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 whatever it is. Then as a student, students know and understand that they can repeat what someone said and ask them to verify if that statement is okay. It helps them to know that it's okay to ask. They could say, same as the teacher, so you're saying, uh, what do you mean by, can you repeat that please? How do you know that? Can you say some more about whatever it was? Are you saying, can you give me an example of that? Basically, as you can see, talk moves are basic sentence starters that students can use. The difference is, that it's a clear integration in your classroom that starts at the beginning of the semester and you as a teacher are using those and reinforcing them and encouraging students to use them. The second talk move I wanna talk about is rephrasing or restating. You can ask students to restate someone else's ideas in their own words. Because one of the biggest problems we have online is that when one student is talking, everybody else checks out, right? They have their cameras off, they have their mics off, they're, God only knows what they're doing. Some, like I've seen pictures of kids hanging upside down on their desks, right? We don't know. But when you utilize talk moves, it actually encourages them to listen. So, you could say something like, can you repeat what Mohammed said in your own words? Or who can explain what Maryam means when she said da 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 da? Or as a student, they can say, they understand that I can restate what someone else said, their ideas, and I can put it into my own words. For example, you could, the student could say, I heard you say, I think I could also explain your thinking by such and such. Did I have that right? And it's nice to have them check because this is the idea of respectful uh, discussion. So you're saying that, do I have that correct? Or in other words, I think you mean this. And of course, if they have it wrong, then the other students can say, no, that's actually not what I meant. And they can fix or rephrase their own thinking. The third talk move is reasoning. With reasoning, as a mm -hmm. teacher, you want to ask students if they agree or disagree with an idea proposed by another student. You can say, do you agree or disagree with that and why? What made you think that? Can you explain your reasoning? Why is it important? And how did you arrive at that conclusion? Is there anything in the text that made you think about that? Get them involved, not only in a discussion, but in the content that they're responsible for. For the student, they can understand that they can apply their own reasoning to somebody else's idea. I agree or disagree with your idea because, right, it's the idea that they have to explain their reasoning. I think your answer is right because I agree with your reasoning of such and such. I agree with this part, but maybe they disagree with something else. I respectfully disagree with this part. And the idea is that you get the kids disagreeing with the idea, not the student and not the person. This is really important in order to maintain a respectful uh, and safe environment. I disagree with your reasoning. And I think da 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 da. I know where you're coming from but I have a different idea. The last talk move I'm gonna to talk to you about today is elaborating or adding on. 
for the teacher, you want to prompt students to challenge, to add on, to elaborate, to increase participation and deepen their understanding. You could say, would someone like to add on to that? Can you give me an example? Are you saying the same thing as Arif? If it's different, how is it different? It really gets them thinking. Can anyone add on to what Sarah was saying? As a student, you understand that you can participate in the discussion by adding comments and sharing your reasoning. So you can say, I'd like to add, I think you're right, but I also think that's a great idea. But don't you think I agree with Sandy when she said, but I also want to add, I think you're right, but I also think such and such. Okay, now it's a little hard to understand this until you actually see it in action. And so I'm going to take you, oh, we did get some people in there, I'm very sorry. Okay, I'm gonna take you so you can watch this video. Oh, come on. All right, this is Talk Moves in Action. This is a middle school classroom, but it can be used, as I said, at any level. And let's hope that it plays. <laughs> Come on, here we go. <laughs> Can you hear it? Miss um, Sandra, unfortunately, we can't hear anything. Um. Ms. Sandra, uh, we are not able to hear anything. No? No, and even we're not able to see anything if you are sharing something on the screen. Oh my goodness. Uh, I well, think you need to stop sharing the, the PowerPoint first, Ms. Sandra, and then make a new share with the video. Okay, okay. We'll do. My son assured me that I had found a new cool way to switch easily and it didn't work. <laughs> and I forgot to click the button to share the sound. There we go. How about now? Children are going to struggle a bit, depending on how confident they feel in speaking up in class. And yet this teacher wants everybody in the class to feel valued. So the kids are all learning phrases that can inspire other kids to contribute more easily. We're trying to build a conversation here that is a community of caring and respect. So look at your talk moves on the table today and I have a post-it note here for you. Talk moves are essentially sentence starters that students can use to get themselves into the conversation and to draw other people into the conversation. By the government and they just can't like figure out what to do. 
that I taped the talk moves right on the table so that they would be ever present in everyone's mind. Today, I want you to keep track of your talk moves. Every time they used a talk move, they put a check on their sticky note. So if somebody at your table looks like they don't have a talk move check mark yet, invite them into the conversation. How could you do that? Say like, what do you think? Definitely. Would you use their name? Yeah. Awesome. Everything about activating a child's cognitive skills begins with activating their social connectedness. Verbalizing and using language and working with peers creates that kind of social stimulus that drives the development of the brain. I pretty much look at the thing every single time to see if there's like something I could say, like a clarifying question. Can you explain more about like why he would get in trouble? Um, he spray painted something on his rival soccer team's um, school, and he like. When you ask a person a clarifying question, it's either oh I heard you said, or can you repeat what you said, or to add on to. They help enormously with language learners. They give everybody a platform to jump into a conversation because half the sentence is there for them already. But they also challenge other types of learners who may be accustomed to doing independent work and they need a bridge to collaborate more with a group. It pushes kids out of their comfort zone of social conversations and it moves them more towards a professional and an academic kind of register. All his accomplishments and... Okay. There's more to that, but I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. All right, so you can see that when the kids are involved in talk moves, they are learning how to challenge ideas, challenge a text, think deeply about things, and they're learning new language. They're doing it in a way that's respectful, it encourages academic discussion through a set of talk moves or sentence starters. It encourages active involvement in both talking and listening. It doesn't allow the students to check out mentally and not listen to what others are saying because the other students are going to come back and you need to be saying, I'm going to add on or I'd like to challenge or I agree or I disagree. And it creates a respectful way to speak to each other. Students learn how to challenge ideas and not other students. And it gives a framework where students know how they can participate. Because half of the problem is they don't know how they're supposed to do it or what can they say to, to, to put out their ideas. And it helps enormously in developing academic vocabulary. When you are using talk moves, make sure that you start early in the semester, early in the year. You want to start small. You don't have to start with all of the talk moves at once, but you can choose like these four that I talked about today are great starters. They're even for the younger uh, students in primary, they have different hand signals that go with it. Like I agree or I'm confused. I disagree with that. I'm thinking differently. You can set up a system of accountability, making students be accountable for their own talk moves and paying attention to others. You wanna be consistent with it. Once you have introduced it and students understand this is the structure in which we have discussions academically in the classroom and it's a way that's respectful and they start to learn the talk moves, it becomes easier for them. They begin to be able to think about the content that you are teaching instead of wondering how they're going to say something. And most of all, you want to be encouraging of your students. Some students struggle, they're second language learners or they have other difficulties, but, as long as you continue to encourage them, 
they will get it and they will learn. Thank you very much. I have run over time. Do you have any questions? Please feel free to send me uh, an email if you have any other questions. Also, if you would like, let me stop sharing this. Thank you, Ms. I have a, um, a document that I can share with you. It's a Word doc. And basically what I did was I combined information from multiple talk moves, posters, and from all over the place, uh, different levels that I felt worked well. Any questions? Yes, thank you, Ms. Anna, for your wonderful presentation. There's a question from Virginia. Can you use it? with a class of more than 40 students, this top moves? You can. It's all about how you group your students. So for example, if you were online, you can put them into breakout rooms into smaller groups. If you're in the classroom, you can have them turn and talk to their a partner next to them, or you can have them use it in groups of three, four, five. I would recommend using it in smaller discussions, but it can also be used as a class-wide discussion tool. That way, as the teacher, I'm asking the students to, I'm using talk moves and they are using them back. Do you see? So it, it doesn't matter how really, if you're online, if you're hybrid, if you are face-to-face, -face, talk moves is amazing. And I wish that I had found it earlier in the semester <laughs> because I only ha had a, a small experience in using it near the end of the semester and it was fabulous. And honestly, I'm so excited to start it again at the beginning of this semester and get students right from the beginning working on this. Okay. Uh, a question I got to Ghulam Ali. The latest learner-centered research advocates 20 to 30 person teacher talk and 70 to 80 person talk in an EFL classroom. How would you relate this to talk groups where it is mostly the teacher who talks? It's not mostly the teacher who talks, not at all. Uh, like I said, you can do it in any way, but this is primarily a tool for students to use as they are discussing. You can use it in a whole classroom discussion, but it is primarily used as a student to student discussion. Okay. So okay. it, I mean, you put them into groups. It's the, the teacher is, as you saw in the video, the teacher was just kind of walking from table to table in online environment. I would go from breakout room to breakout room to breakout room and listen in on the students' discussions, and they had to create a document. I would usually give them a Google Doc that they had to work on, but they were the ones having the discussion. And it went, my shy, shy students who would sit there quietly suddenly started talking. They, I found it miraculous, quite honestly. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Are there any other questions uh, from Ms. Sandra? You're welcome to uh, ask any question. You are very welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Sandra. It Thank was you. wonderful. We learned a lot again from all the presenters. It was wonderful presentations by all for presenters. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you Mr. Tijan, and best of luck to you all. Thank you very much. I want to thank our outstanding speakers for excellent presentations and uh, for making this event exciting and meaningful. Um, thanks a lot to all who participated and organized this event to success, especially Ms. Nabiha and Ms. Malek. Thank you very much. 
Uh, finally, I'd like to thank our uh, dear guests for devoting your valuable time and attention and for your remarkable contributions. You'll be receiving your certificates along with a small gift from us as a token of gratitude really soon. So keep on checking your inboxes regularly next week. Uh, you will receive an email from Malek with, uh, with the gift and the certificate. If you have any questions about anything, you can always post it to them either on our Facebook page, our uh, LinkedIn page, or you can send us an email at uh, info at teachagen.com. If you have any questions to the presenters uh, and the, the guest speakers, you can also send them to us and we will forward them to you and we will reply, uh, we'll provide you with a reply as soon as possible. Have a lovely evening, all of you, and till we meet again. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye and thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.